We're in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? I know that most everyone I would imagine is familiar with this passage of Scripture and why God was needing to call Adam. You see, the Bible tells us that God came down in the cool of the evening, the cool of the day, of the day and walked communed with Adam and Eve. And they looked forward to his presence. There was a special bond there between the Creator and his creation. There was a oneness there. They enjoyed each other's presence. They enjoyed that time spent together. That's the way God planned it. We don't know what God may have talked with Adam and Eve about, but I believe that those were special times that they had together, and that Adam and Eve looked forward to when God would come and be with them. But you know that they broke God's law, and they ate the fruit that they were fit, forbidden to eat of, came into the knowledge of good and evil. And suddenly, they no longer look forward to God's presence. And they hid themselves and endeavored to stay out of God's sight because they were afraid. They felt guilty. Now God, of course, knew where they were. It wasn't that he was incapable of finding them. But this was the first time that he had to call for them. Normally they were ready. They were waiting. They were seeking him. God was calling for Adam because he wanted to know what happened. Why are you trying to hide from me? If you think about that situation, there's a great sadness to that story. Whenever a man and a woman, the first human beings that God created, lost that special relationship with God. What a sad, sad day that was. To go from having communion with the Holy God, breaking down and walk with you, to being guilty and afraid. And it changed not only Adam and Eve's life, but it changed the future for all of humanity. And we've come to the place where that same voice rings out today to each and every one. Where art thou? Where art thou in relationship with me? Is there something between you and your God. God's voice brings out seeking humanity. He wants to have communion with this creation. He wants to restore us back to the state where we can commune with Him. Where we can be one with Him. Where we can be His children. If you don't know where you are tonight, if when God says, where art thou, you're unsure, God's word can help us 
to locate where we are. Because God gave us a written law. He gave us the word of God and the law to live by. Because there was a break in that fellowship and there's a tendency for man to sin. And indeed the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. <clears throat> we have God's holy word to instruct us in his laws, his plans, his provision for the family of man, his purposes for us. I would like to take a few minutes to look through some of the answers that will come as, a, as an answer to the question of where art thou? If God asks, where art thou? And you're a Christian, you can answer, I'm in Christ. I'm saved. <coughs> I'm with you. I'm in the arms of Jesus. I'm leaning on his loving breast. I'm under the shadow of his wings, under his protection. I'm safe. I'm walking in heavenly places on the highway of holiness. A Christian can answer in a positive way. A Christian does not have to be afraid of the question, where art thou? Because they've been restored back to a relationship with their God. They've been forgiven. Their guilt is gone. They're no longer afraid of the presence of God. They seek the presence of God. They enjoy the presence of God. We as Christians are blessed when we can be in the presence of God and the Spirit. It's a wonderful place to be. There is no fear in that question. And that is a wonderful, marvelous thing. It brings us back into the experience of God that Adam and Eve had there in the garden, where we can be his children, walking and talking with him. That's God's plan for us as a family of men, that we would be able to have that answer to the question, where art thou? Unfortunately, there's many people in the world today they cannot give that answer. What about those that profess to be Christians? They say that, yes, I'm a Christian. I have a relationship with God. There's many religions in the world today that profess Christianity. Some people are deceived. They truly believe that they are Christians. They deceive themselves because it's what they want. They want to live a certain kind of life and they found a religion that teaches that. They found a teaching that suits them and they deceive themselves into believing that all is right between them and God. Many people are deceived by false teachers. That's a low battery. No battery.
taught them something that is simply not the truth. They've, been, they've come to believe doctrines that do not offer real salvation. Doctrines that do not provide a change of heart, a true change of life. They give the appearance of a religious activities and fellowship, but they have no power to make a person truly holy. They don't have the power to restore a person to a right relationship with God. Some people that are professing Christianity have simply grown cold. And they no longer have an actual experience with God. They simply have a profession that they're living, saying that they're a Christian. The Bible says that there's people that deny the power of godliness by their lives, by the reality that they're not truly a new creature in Christ. They simply have a profession of Christianity. People that are blind to spiritual things they have simply a form of godliness, but they don't have that power in their life. The power to be a new creature in Christ. There's other professors of Christianity that are actually fighting against the truth. They're actively enemies to the truth of, God, of the gospel. The truth of the gospel brings them under conviction. And so they stand against it. They oppose the truth. They seek to divide and destroy, to confuse. Many times the professor of Christianity is in worse shape than a person that simply knows that they're a sinner. Because they have something that is appeasing their conscience. They have something that they, the devil can use to tell them that they're all right. But they're also in worse shape because many times they're causing others to be lost through their teachings and false doctrine. When a call goes out from God, where art thou? To someone that's a professor of Christianity but does not truly have the experience. They have no good answer to give to God. Let's also consider the backslider. Where art thou? Thou one that once knew the things of God. That had an experience with the Almighty God. That had been restored to right relationship with God. It's now in a worse condition than if they have never been seen. Because they have crucified Christ afresh. They're spiritually destitute, without hope. If a person that's a backslider were to die in that condition, think of the punishment. Think of what they would have to remember. Remembering that they were once right with God. And that the devil has somehow stolen that away from them. And they can remember the good things that they had. Fortunately, God still loves you. There's still opportunity as long as you have life. Yes. But where you are, where art thou? A backslider is in a very deplorable condition. Right. You need to take action. It's a very serious situation. And then, to the person that's never known God, that's never professed to know God, that's a sinner living outside the ark of safety, living in rebellion to God, maybe trying to deny 
that God is really who He says He is. Not believing in Christianity. You're also in a very serious condition. Because that's a hopeless condition. If you do not believe in the plan of salvation, how will you ever deal with the guilt that you feel? And there's no getting away from the reality of the guilt that every human being experiences when they live in sin. You're away. You're separated from God. Your Creator. The Creator God that puts something in the heart of man that acknowledges God. You're somewhere between the beginning of your life and the end of your life. And you're approaching every day nearer to the end. <coughs> and eternity for a sinner means that you're going to go to hell. There is no other hope for a sinner unless they change their path and accept the gospel. Amen. Sinner, you're lost. You're going through this world from day to day and you're lost. You don't have a clear picture of how to arrive where you want to go. As you go down the pathway of life, you can't see the beginning from the end. You can't see your right hand from your left. You're under the control and influence of the devil. He is driving you, seeking to destroy you. Lost. Without hope. As we think in terms of God looking down from heaven on the family of man, and calling out to his creation and saying, Where art thou? Think about it there in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve having hid themselves in the bushes or somewhere where they felt like they were away from God. Think how they felt. They knew they had done wrong. They knew they had disobeyed the commandment that God had given them. And they didn't know how to undo what they did. They didn't have a way to get rid of the guilt they were feeling. And they were afraid of the presence of Almighty God. That was a frightening thing to them. When a sinner comes into the presence of God, it's not a comfortable experience. That's just a reality. Whenever the Holy Spirit is in this place, dealing with the hearts of unsaved, whether you be a professor of Christianity, whether you be one that once knew Christ and has lost Him out of your life, or whether you're a sinner that's never known God and you acknowledge that. Regardless of what your exact the exact way or reason why you're outside of the ark of safety, living in sin, your experience is the same. When you're in the presence of God and His Holy Spirit, God's convicting power convicts you your sin. And that's not a comfortable experience. It creates a discomfort. It creates a reality or a realization of the guilt that we have for wrongdoing. And the need that we have for something different. Now as the question comes to us tonight of where art thou? We need to be prepared to answer honestly. 
That's not me up here asking that question. Think of it as the voice of Almighty God. Amen. Uh, seeking, seeking His children, yes. His creation, desiring to draw them to Him. And He's asking, where are you? Where are you? Why would you reject me? Why would you disobey me? Think about it for a moment. If the Holy Spirit is witnessing to you and convicting you that your profession that you've had, that your religion that you're endeavoring to stand on is vain, that it does not truly give you power over sin, that it does not truly give you power to be a new creature in Christ, that it does not allow you to live holy before a holy God. You need to be willing to acknowledge that, to face that. Be willing to be honest with yourself before God. If that question finds you remembering back to when you were once a Christian and how you were ensnared by the power of that wicked one and that experience was stolen away. You need to acknowledge that. You need to be honest with yourself. If you're a sinner and you're lost and guilty before God, and the Holy Spirit is witnessing that to you. You need to face it. Don't try to hide from God. Don't try to think about something else and pretend that the Spirit is not real, that the Spirit is not touching your heart. We need to know for certain where we are in relation to God. We need to know for sure. We need to be confident. We need to be sure of our salvation. That we can answer when God asks where we are, that I'm saved in the arms of Jesus. What a wonderful testimony. It just makes a, a joy well up within you. To think of that relationship that you have with our Creator. Until we can clearly acknowledge our current state, we're unable to make any proper decision about what we're going to do about that. If you're not willing to acknowledge where you are in relation to God, then how can we be prepared to make any choices to change? Christian here tonight, rejoice. Yes. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let yourself rejoice in the goodness of God. Continue on in this great way. Stay true to God no matter what happens in life. Let nothing come between you and this wonderful Savior. Amen. But if there's something wrong between you and God, if the Spirit of God is telling you tonight that there's something wrong. If He's convicting you of sin, if He's convicting you that there's a need in your heart, you need to face that and you need to do something about it. You need to take action. No one is ever going to be saved against their will. No one is going to be saved as long as they're determined to rebel against God. You have to be willing to listen to that still, small voice that's pricking at your conscience, that's touching your heart, saying, God is seeking me. God is seeking to save me from my sins, to make me pure and holy, to forgive me, to restore me, to bring me into oneness with Him. To make me a child of God. 
the holy God, the creator of the earth, the creator of humanity, is calling your name, seeking you, endeavoring to show you the needs that you have. This need that we have to be God's children. We cannot force you. We have no desire to force you to be a Christian. Christianity has never been forced on anyone. Amen. There's religions in the world today that spread by the use of force. If you're in, under their control and you do not claim to follow their way, they can kill you. They can imprison you and endeavor to force you to follow their teachings. Christianity is not a forceful religion. Christianity, the call of God to humanity, is offering something. It's offering a better way to live. It's offering freedom from sin. It's offering to set humanity free from the bondage that Satan has them in. The reality is that if you're living a sinful life tonight, Satan is in control. He has bound you in the fetters, the chains of sin. And you are not able to break those loose yourself. You're not able to just choose to live a better life to do this some self-help, some self-improvement, and become a good person. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can set us free from our sin. When the Holy Spirit deals with our hearts and draws us, He's offering something. He's offering forgiveness. He's offering to break those bonds so that you do not have to continue on that downward path. So you do not have to continue to sin. So you do not have to continue a life that is going to lead to your destruction. He wants to remove that guilt and stain of sin and put a new spirit within you. Adam and Eve could not hide from God's call. When he said, Where art thou? They were compelled to answer. And as much as you might like to not have to answer tonight, that's not an option. You cannot ignore the call of God. You can refuse the call of God. You can refuse to choose to serve God. You cannot ignore the call. You cannot pretend that He has not touched your heart. And you cannot reject God and be guiltless. You cannot come into the presence of God's Spirit and be dealt with to have the opportunity to become a Christian and go away unchanged. Any time that we reject God, there's a result in that. It's a serious thing. You're not just making a statement of, well, I don't really like that preacher very well, and he's not even a very good preacher, and maybe some other time I'll listen to somebody that can help me, or that's more appealing. It's not that simple. We cannot reject God and be guiltless. I want you to understand that if you're under conviction tonight, it's a precious, precious thing. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be laughed off. It's from God. It's from His Holy Spirit. We should walk in awe of the Spirit of God. It's the power of God coming down in our midst. It's a precious thing. 
I would encourage you tonight that if there's anything between you and God, that you make it right. That you seek Him while He may be found. That you call upon Him while He is near. That you don't let this opportunity pass you by. There's a song that we sing at home. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my feeble cry. You don't have to be one of the great ones of the earth to be saved. Salvation is for all. You don't need to clean yourself up and make yourself better before you can be saved. Salvation is designed for the sinner, for the guilty, for the needy. That's who Jesus came to save. Amen. That's the preparation He made for us. We were all sinners at one time, standing in need of salvation. God is calling. Where art thou? Do you hear Him? Echoing down through the ages of eternity, that call from God, going out to the family of man, won't you come to Him? Won't you seek Him? Have Him meet the deepest needs of your heart. The things that you don't tell anyone else. The things that you deal with in your bed at night when all is dark and quiet. The realization deep in your heart that something is not right between you and God.